Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 323, my chat with improviser Joe Thompson. But first, I thought I'd mention how Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. Audible is the app for listening to books, you guys. Reading is out, listening is in. In between your true crime and celeb interview podcasts, why not listen to the new Stephen King thriller that just came out? Or maybe you want to check out Brene Brown's books, but they just seem like so much to get into. Let her read it to you. You guys, make something in your life easy. This app is easy. Audible is a one-stop shop for podcasts, books, and cool new music releases. It's definitely worth your time. Heck, every podcast I listen to is selling it to you, too. It's popular. So go now to audibletrial.com forward slash yes, but why to sign up and get your account today. I'd really love to see that you signed up with my promo code because it helps. Audible provides you access to hundreds of books and podcasts, so much entertainment, all read to you by talented voice artists. It's the right thing to do. And now let me tell you about my guest this week. This week, Yes But Why chatted with Joe Thompson, an improv performer and teacher who co-runs the Spontaneity and Sheffield Steel Theatre Group in Sheffield, UK. Listen in to this deep dive discussion on storytelling, world building, and the culture of improv communities. I now present to you Yes But Why episode 323, Joe Thompson on finding the tools to create your own worlds. Enjoy. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why. 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 This is the Yes But Why podcast. the corner of my eye saw you move something so i was like you oh, need no, no, you can readjust this. if you'd like that was me just wiping the lens because for some reason i've got some jj abrams going on up here so oh yeah you know it's just natural light uh some yeah, jj yeah. abrams it's okay you're very hip you're like so jj abrams right now yeah i'm so jj abrams yeah i feel like but more force awakens and rise of skywalker <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I feel like there was an article I just saw that something bad associated with J.J. Abrams. So, like, if later we look it up mm. and it turns out he's done something terrible, know that that's not what I mean. No, I because I, I said it first, so like you know, I, I'll I'll take it. Um, I also um, really love him because none of his stuff truly makes sense. Like, there are oh, moments yeah. in a lot of his shows where you're like. Wait, what? Like they jump yeah. the shark pretty pretty well. Like um like Felicity his first show is a very basic college show about a girl falling in love with a guy and going following him to college. Very basic romantic comedy, mm-hmm. easy going, mm-hmm. fun. Four seasons because you know, that is the length of the college experience for this girl, right? But Absolutely. for some reason, when we get to the fourth season, the whole show is just off the rails. Like there are all these weird theme episodes where like suddenly it's like an Alfred Hitchcock thing. And then all of a sudden there's a time travel element and you're like, wait, what the hell is going on? It's like somebody was like, JJ, have you read this sci-fi? And he's like, what? Okay. What? Like it was like, he just found out and tried it all on Felicity. He just got bored of what he's doing in it. and he was like oh i've already said i'm gonna do four series so yeah. rather than drop this and move on to a new thing i'm gonna take these new things i want to do and cram them all into the last series of but then i find jj abrams fascinating because have you ever heard seen his ted talk on the mystery box no so he has a really interesting writing philosophy that explains so many of jj abrams approaches to his shows and his films oh God, where he I talks about watch. this idea of when he was a kid he used to go to like a magic shop and there was this box that you could buy for a certain amount of money but the owner would never show what was in it 
And so how he got obsessed with like the mystery of what was in this box and he eventually bought it. And I think it was like playing cards or something, but he was like, but what was in the box isn't what mattered. It was the, the waiting to see what it might be and the actual existence of the mystery box itself that was important. And I watched that and went, Oh, that's oh. everything that I've, not liked about a J.J. Abrams film or, or TV show that I've watched is the mystery existing matters more than whether the the answer is satisfying, which is why there's so many unsatisfying twists in J.J. Uh, Abrams films or like the answer to questions is usually like, oh, that's actually a bit disappointing. I feel like that's like the reason for so much of of television because like you have to keep television going. Like television yeah. is a story that has to keep going. Like you write a movie, it ends, right? You can finish it, but like a TV show has to keep going. Right. So like when yeah, you said yeah. that, like the mystery is there, the first thing I thought of, and this is a ridiculous reference and I can't believe I'm even making it. But the first thing that I thought of was who's the boss. These two were going to flirt forever. They don't need to ever get together. That's a mystery box. What's going to happen if they ever get together? That's the mystery. We don't, ever need to know what happened turns out it's boring no one likes it break them yeah. up immediately right no one wants it they just want the build up they just want the build up to that that mystery is that too every show where there's a couple that like will they won't they that is the mystery box oh my god i can't wait to watch this ted talk thank you so much other thing that he wrote because i'm clearly obsessed with jj abrams um <laughs> He wrote this book with his friend, so he became rich. He did all his movies, whatever. And then once he's got money and he can do whatever, and everyone just says yes, J.J. Abrams, to whatever he wants to do, he decides he's going to make this book with his friend. And I don't know what the actual name of the book is, but the, when you buy the book, the title written on the book is The Ship of Theseus, right? And what it is, is it's a book where there is a written text of a book called ship of theseus with uh someone who wrote it i think it's them of course that wrote it but it's got like the name of a woman as the as the writer in there there's a full novel but also in this book is uh full um letters back and forth between two characters written on the pages of the whole book all the way through it and it's a love story throughout the book and then there's also little bits of things tucked in the book so when you get it it's like in a box and then you, when you open it up like there's little maps and there's like ticket stubs and there's like little pictures of things that's and it's so this cool. whole like developed like and you can read it however you want and you can like you can read the the book first and then read the story around it you can like i don't even know you can approach it whatever way you want and the idea of that i was like this is such a jj abrams idea like yeah. here is a thing with a thousand ways you can get it take it however you want here you go like mm. amazing uh so cool I really was super into that. And the mystery box thing man, now ferments a bit of that for me as well. I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, because interestingly, what he did at one point was he sold mystery boxes. So he, sure. these big, he built like, pro well, I don't know if he built them, but he got these big proper wooden style boxes with like a num numerical lock on it. Uh, and you wouldn't be sent the code with it. Um, and the advertising never told you what was in the box. So you just bought this box and then tried to work out how to unlock it to then see what was inside. Uh, I can't remember what was in it now. I think it was something something fairly simple, but the whole point was it was this idea of like not knowing what was in there that was the whole point. Yeah. It's just like a piece of paper that says life is disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is the problem, and this is my only issue with the mystery box concept, is if you build too much of the story around, no, no, this question will get answered, but it not being answered for now is what makes it important. Mm. You, that's when you, you're then setting up uh, something for a payoff that's just not going to be feasible. Sure. You know, you're, uh, you, you know, it's like the How I Met Your Mother problem. The whole thing is that entire show, literally in the title, is like, this is how we're going to answer this question, which means that further, more and more pressure as the series goes on is put on that eventual ending, mm. which then means that the amount that people expect from the ending is more than can ever be achieved by any one writer. Or actually, an example I use a lot is like 
Doctor Who during Stephen Moffat's era, where there were all of these like, oh, the Doctor is dead. He's definitely dead. How is he going to get out of this one? And then they answered it. It was like, well, because this was an impossible situation, your solution was weirdly disappointing because it it wasn't clever. It was just you got out of the situation. But I only expected it to be clever because you put so much around this one thing happening. And so the solution to the problem was like the thing that everyone was thinking about. So I'm fascinated by writers almost writing themselves in that corner because they really enjoy having the mysteries that audiences become obsessed with. But what they don't like is then having to go, right, well, there's an expectation now that audiences have in in some level of, of, of answer to this question. Yeah. I feel like it's almost like it makes me think of Chekhov's gun. You know what I mean? Like yes. once that gun appears, you know it's going to get shot, right? So similarly, like yes. once there's a box, you know we're going to agonize about whether or not we're going to ever get into it, right? But the gun has a very simple, like all it needs to be, all it needs to happen is it needs to be shot. Doesn't exactly. necessarily have to kill anyone. Like it just that just has one ending. It's just when. It's not what, it's when, right? So it's like it sort of simplifies the same idea without um without there being as much of a buildup that can't be fulfilled, right? Exactly. That being said, I feel like there are some writers that build stories so perfectly and like everything fits perfectly that I'm like, could you talk to JJ Abrams? Could you guys like work together? Like, I feel like if you guys work together, you really could accomplish some amazing stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <clears throat> like I loved how I met your mother because the idea of how I met your mother was a story that they essentially wrote the entirety of before they got the show and then had to develop ways to keep you from getting to the end. Um, but they knew, but the end was done and ready and like prepared for at the beginning before anything else happened. The 10 years of the show, just cause it happened to be popular. It's just cause they kept dragging it out. Well, maybe they won't, maybe they won't. Who knows? You're never going to meet her. Yet. You're never going to meet her. But like you meet her and she's not even the most important thing in the whole thing. She appears for, th sorry, spoiler. Or, do, have you seen the no, show? No. I, I have a, a vivid memory of watching the finale and okay. away with very confused I'm just making that. sure because I was like, hold on, don't just spoil this entire <laughs> show for this man. But essentially, like, she appears for three seconds and dies. Like, that's all she's yeah, there yeah. for. You know what I mean? Like, she's there to be sh – she's important, you know, because she was an important person in his life, whatever. But now she's dead, so she's – her love is not the thing that we're building this story for, right? So the idea that they chose that at the very beginning and, like, knew this isn't a love story. It's called How I Met Your Mother, but it's not about the mother. It's mm. about Robin. Like, and it's like, what? And yeah, I was mad. I, I was mad when it happened. But later, I was like, I realized, like, my brain was like, it was the only way it made sense. And I was like, you're right. Yeah. You're right. And also there's something so amazing about the fact that they went in, knew the end of their story. And then just built out the middle. Like they were like, this is the beginning, middle and end. We can fill in adventures in between, right? If that's not a friggin' perfect tailor-made television show, I don't know what is. Like, so, you know what I mean? Uh, I've realized a lot of my favorite TV shows are, um, rather than being made, uh, oh, I can't remember the two terms, but there's this idea of like plotted writers versus procedural writers so writers who go i'm gonna plan the whole thing and then i'm gonna fill out the gaps and then there are those who are like i cannot I, I have to just sort of allow things to appear in front of me as i go so i know the most uh famous example i know of that is george r, r. martin when he writes game of thrones which i find bizarre because of how complex the game of thrones totally. world is. but he's like oh no this i put the tracks down in front of me as the train goes forward to which i'm always like considering you're making like maps and there are like kingdoms and all these systems there's a certain level of genius that i find i hate the term genius because it fundamentally believes that creativity is some kind of unachievable thing but the level of like <laughs> ability to connect all those dots is something that i find incredibly impressive however in terms of my favorite shows so many of them do have shows films etc they have a feeling of like 
we started with a frame and we filled in the gaps rather than starting at the beginning and going towards the end. Yes. Um, like, for example, um, I recently watched the entire, after loads of suggestions from friends and family, finally got around to watching um, Avatar The Last Airbender, the animated show. And that is another example of uh, they knew how it was going to start, they knew what the steps were going to be, and they knew how it was going to end. And then the episodes were just... And it does mean you get the occasional episode where they went, oh, I think they got one more episode than they were planning to for this series, <laughs> and they just had to come up with an, a, a thing to happen in the episode. You know, the classic filler episode. Yeah. Um, but but overall, when, when you take it all in its entirety, it feels like a perfect show because it feels deliberate. Everything feels... Like, this is the direction we we're, we're going to go. It doesn't feel at any point like they suddenly were going, oh, okay, well, so what happens next? Yeah. Um, which is also very difficult to do because from what I understand about the world of TV, shows get cancelled last minute and also shows get just continuously renewed even though writers want to wrap it up. They get told, nope, we're giving you another series and we're going to offer you more and more money until you do it. Um, and And... And then also writers have the creative approach of working out as they go along and then suddenly going, oh, I thought, like, for example, I know Stranger Things was supposed to end and the season just gone. But the writer said, oh, we found out we had a whole other season in our heads to do and we couldn't cram it all into a, a final season. Which gives me the sense that actually they were like, they they had a plan, but the plan didn't fit into the original scope of what they wanted to do, and they had to go, okay, so now we have a plan and a bit more of a plan. Yeah. Well, I feel like... <clears throat> I feel like they're definitely doing what you mentioned as procedural, where it's like, as soon as they find out they get a new thing, they're like, okay, well, let's explore it in a different way. And I appreciate that. You know what I mean? Like, as far yeah. as they're just sort of like, okay, well, um, and also the best part, in my opinion, when you work with child actors is to accept that they are aging right is to be like okay yeah. so let's put this story a little further along because these kids are now older right um and because it stinks when you do a show and you watch it and you see this one kid just like wait did he just get a beard like what just yeah. happened <laughs> like wasn't he eight last season and it's like oh I'm yeah such a you know <clears throat> i'm having such a difficult time being a nine-year-old <laughs> Exactly. They're like, shave him. Come on. Oh, my God. But but there's something I mean, I appreciate the idea of that, like the way that people write in that way. And I think it's just different ways our brains work. Like we were talking about the idea of the way earlier we were talking about the idea of the way our creative writing um, brains work and what we're looking for and how we develop the story. And I feel like that's probably the case. I mean, maybe there are writers who end up in situations where what they're being asked to do is different than what they normally mm -hmm. do. And that can be difficult. But like, if you're a, let's see how it goes. Let's throw stuff up on the wall. Like, then I bet you really enjoyed writing on the lost. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, I heard yeah. like uh, a couple of uh, podcast episodes with the writers of that. And they're just like, and then we found out we had another season and we were like, um, what? And like, like <laughs> they just didn't, they're like sitting there in a room, like putting post-it notes up. Like maybe this happens. I don't know. What's the black smoke. Oh shit. We got to solve the black smoke. Like, you know, different things were like, as opposed to, Okay, this is the plan. The whole time, this is what it is, you know? No, I, it was just I, total craziness, like total insanity, like every week at the whim. That other part of it, too, is it was written while it was being watched, which I think is terrible. Also, oh, the George R.R. Yeah. R. Martin issue. No, no, don't listen to us. Stop. Yeah. Stop. I no. Mean, that's the, the entire problem with the final season of Queer of Thrones is – in many ways. And also, I have this same issue with um, Star Wars and what happened with Star Wars in the sequel trilogy, which I was enjoying. And then I watched the final one and I went, oh, no, they listened to the fans. Never listened. This is the worst thing that could happen. They're wrong. And it's literally like uh, people make joke episodes of shows based on, like, what what would happen if if the fans got complete control yeah. about like I've seen things where they're like oh and these characters are going to get together and it's going to turn out that oh I'm actually your dad and I'm actually a good guy and I've been and it's just a horrible mismatch because 
a group of people will not have any cohesion on what they want, just what they don't want. It's a lot easier for everyone to get together and dislike something because everyone's got their own vision of what it should be. But as long as it's unanimously not what it was, then they can just be like, it is just bad. But Rise of Skywalker, I remember being like, you've you've tried to veto some of the more risk risky choices of the previous film, which I enjoyed it being a risk-taking film, and that was what made it so divisive. But because you have you've tried to reconcile with the people who didn't like those decisions, you've done you've you've basically made it so they're still unhappy because those things still happened short of completely getting rid of that film which isn't going to happen you've you've essentially still left them upset but you've also then pulled it back from those who are like i really like the fact that we were taking risks and you've made them go oh no they're not taking risks they they, they made a mistake in take like they decided those risks were wrong and now they're going to go back on them so you've just upset everyone um and i on I, I i can't i now can't watch that last film of the trilogy without having that real sense of like it's too it's too connected with the fans and the audience and therefore getting actually immersed in it as a piece of media is really difficult because you can't help but see it as a series of decisions between creatives and, and audience members that ended up just pulling it apart and really stretching it really thin so that you aren't you don't watch it and get just immersed in the world. You just watch it and start going, oh, and they made that decision. Why did they make that decision? Why have they done that? Oh, well, they probably did that because the audience said this, and you're just not enjoying it. You're just thinking about it rather than watching it. You know, I think the what you're making me think of, not only just, like, why are we listening to the audience? We're the artists. They're the audience. Like, And don't get me wrong. Like, when they clap, we like it. Yay. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like, you have the special skill. You are the artist. You know what the right thing is in this story, in this world that you've created. And when you start listening to them, you know, maybe they don't have the same vibe as you. Even when we've been talking about where, like, you and I have different ways of, like, approaching writing. We could be given Mm -hmm. the exact same assignment and write totally different things purely because that's just the way that it works and we like the way the writer's doing it already why do you adjust yourself you know i mean i was gonna say just there's an aspect of issues with this around franchising which i think is the uh, Mm. and and um and adaptation not as a form of like i am an artist who really wants to i would love to see an adaptation of this thing as a creative, I really like this book. I want to see it adapted, but rather these, you know, Star Wars is great. We need more people to do Star Wars. Let's approach directors to do Star Wars. But like, that's part of the problem is they are in many ways coming in as a, as someone who was either a fan or not a fan first, and then came on and gone, I would love to do something with this franchise. But then it's about this idea of like, in many ways, you are adding into your writing your interpretation of the characters and um, world into your continuation of the story. And so it then becomes like, fundamentally, you as the artist disagreeing with the direction of that franchise to the fans. And so it feels like a personal disagreement, whereas actually, if you were just doing your own thing, people would then make the decision on the spot of like, this is for me or this isn't for me, but it becomes more, the conflict is built in Mm. because it's like, oh, I liked this thing and then you started writing it or you started doing something with it and now I don't. And therefore, you've taken away my sense of this being something I enjoy. Despite the fact, as I continuously like to point out to everyone who says things like that, you can just not watch those films or watch those episodes of the TV show. And obviously, it's so much easier said than done, but to a certain extent, like, People seem to genuinely think that by something being continued in a way that they don't like, that it's in some way spoils whatever part of it they really enjoyed. Mm, Yeah. I think that the hard part about it is that it takes away from that artist, like you said, who is reimagining, who is creating something, who's been given this opportunity. They're like, hey, take these characters. You, we know what they are, but then they themselves are creating something, you know, that is uh, different, but in their own point of view. And um, 
it's just a, it's just a matter of the audience isn't really part of that and we need to start uh, accepting the fact that even though yeah sure they gotta buy stuff and I appreciate the commerce of this sort of situation when it's in a big studio and whatnot but like you know artists have to create what they have to create and just be okay with whatever happens to it you know what I mean like and that's the hardest part and I appreciate the people who it's their they make millions of dollars they're at this like money making high level there's like network executives with like opinions and stuff about everything that they're doing there's so much more business involved in what they're creating so it's hard to really do it but for the artists themselves I mean they have to let go at some point. You know, they, they create something, they put it out there, people like it or they don't, they make money or they don't, you have to just release it, you know, because otherwise you would just stop. And mm -hmm. once you're at that level, you really even can't. Like, even if you decide you don't like it anymore, too bad. That's your job. You make millions, yeah. take it. Like, like you know. And, and I, I think to a certain extent, it all kind of rolls back. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I'm biased on this because I would consider myself quite an active socialist. But I think capitalism has an influence on the way that we do art in a way that we can't... <sighs> the the relationship between audience and artists would be radically changed if the concept of the the exchange of money between the audience and the artist was flipped and if you take it back to an assumed version of like cavemen around the fire where storytelling was a social thing as much as it was like oh i've created this thing and i wanted to show it with you the the relationship between um art and livelihood and then on the flip side consumption of art with people paying out their money it i think it really it it sculpts the entire way that we like we qualify art we uh decide whether something is good or bad where we decide someone who is a talented director or if they're a, a hollywood grifter it's all just built on the fact that we've everyone involved in it has a monetary investment in it so there's this sense of like everyone going oh you know why is this person making money on or making my money on this when it's not what i like they're just grifting and it's like well actually i'm an artist i've worked really hard to be here i shouldn't have to continuously justify my existence just because you personally don't enjoy my art but then actually if you took away that superstructure i don't think we talk about it in the same way mm -mm. no absolutely not and in fact if we learned anything from the pandemic, it's that they don't have our back. <laughs> like, no. as far as artists, like, the audience is mad at us for some reason. We're creating or not creating. They like it and they don't like it. They're never going to be our pals, right? They're like, dance, monkey, dance. But that's why I'm trying to, <laughs> honestly, person by person that I talk to, I feel like one of the crusades I have is to be like, we need to just appreciate ourselves. We need yeah, to yeah. just be okay with, um, with what we are creating and, um, how, how this, uh, works out, you know? Um, and, and, and just to be able to create our own work and create our own, um, pieces and know that, this work that I put out is good enough. You know, they like it or they don't like it, but you kind of have to accept it because turns out, you know, the hoi polloi who doesn't make it thinks that it's like super easy and AI can do it. So, you know, yeah, yeah. it's that it's a tough road as always, you know, and, and we need to navigate it. Now I wanted to ask you, I want to pause our conversation right here by saying that um, I am very fascinated by this whole conversation that we've had about all these other writers and how they're developing stuff. And I'm like totally down to talk about this forever, but I know it's important mm -hmm. for us to chat about you. So let's get into you and how you are creative. When you were a little kid, what creative games were you playing? Yeah. So I was very much uh, creative play over overall else as a kid um i was very much not a sporty young boy at all uh <laughs> games of football were avoided um i actually 
very briefly, apparently, according to my mom, was like, I want to go and do football. And then a month later, it was like, I don't want to do this anymore. It's cold and I get wet a lot because it rains. And my mum was like, yeah, that's part of football. I didn't think this was being going to be involved. I just like the idea of the fact that my friends played football and I, I was always wanting to play like Pokemon. So, uh, but I was big into creative play and I grew up of an era, speaking of Pokemon, actually, I grew up of an era where I feel like a lot of franchises were like, we're going to hand you the tools to do your own episodes of the show. So I grew up watching Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, um, uh, things like Bayer Blades, like shows that were built to sell to- Transformers to a certain extent, shows to built to sell toys, but the whole point is you bought the toys or, or the cards or something to create your own version of it. Like, um, you know, the whole idea is kind of something that I feel like isn't quite as much of a thing anymore, but like, toys and merchandise were being sold as like here are the tools to like do your own version so like i i remember they sold um obviously i had a load of Yu-Gi-Oh cards but then i found out they had uh the kind of like wrist card holder that was on the show and that was the thing to have because yeah. you could stand up and do your own proper anime style like Yu-Gi-Oh style matches so i did a lot of that i was also the eldest of uh, three with two younger sisters um, so I I went into director mode a lot I like to <laughs> lead little shows, I remember directing a lot of shows with my sisters in where you know, it was my creative vision that I just sort of funneled them into, uh, same with uh, playing pretend, I'd create the world and then they were allowed to choose their characters as long as the characters were vetted by me um, <laughs> um, and then I remember, you know my earliest stage of getting into improv was watching Who's Lines It Anyway and being like, this is the best thing ever. Right, you two, we're playing sound effects and I'm going to do the sound effects and you're going to do the miming. And they're like, oh, okay. But because you're the eldest brother, to a certain extent, there was this feeling of they they were just going, oh, cool. If you say that's what we're going to do, that's what we're going to do. You do have that influence as an eldest sibling, uh, which was great for me because it got, it got me straight into leading creative uh, stuff like that. Um, I'm very, very lucky I haven't turned into a massive control freak. Or maybe I have and I'm just not asking the right people. I just, um, but yeah, I, mean, I used to get really into like a lot of that. And I used to really enjoy the, the more immersive, the better when it came to my creative play. I remember one of my favorite childhood memories was uh, we used to go to holiday a lot. We used to like meet kids on holiday uh we used to go to like little campsites around the uk and some of the more like picturesque areas we'd go camping there and then the 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 tradition was always on the first day we'd go to the common campsite playground you'd meet other kids and then you would play with them the entire of the time that you were there together and you would hope that your holidays kind of mainly crossed over otherwise you were going to have to find new friends in like the second half of your holiday because they left in the first week and then you were there for the second week and you were only crossing over for a short period. But we we went on this one holiday uh, to a place that was like a campsite that backed onto like a full forest that we could just explore in our own time. We bumped into these other kids who were at the time building a den. We joined in, we built a den with them. It was great. And then we started playing this game where they were all into like, war games and you know i was you know, i was a a boy of an age where i was like yeah things with guns cool this is cool um and so we started playing essentially the equivalent of like a multiplayer shooting video game but purely imagination based but the thing that made it work is everyone was really open to playing by the rules that everyone set so like if someone shot you and said i hit you there was no argument and it's one of the biggest things that I think kids find themselves getting stuck on when playing creatively is we always talk about kids are like more creative than the best of us. And it's true, but kids are also not very good at sharing successes. <laughs> so like, it's that classic thing of like, uh, no, I had a bulletproof shield actually, or, ah, oh, well actually all your bullets went around me and didn't quite hit me. But for this one game, we just all mutually agreed. Okay. Yeah. You got me. So I'm out. And, it stuck with me that just by being that accepting of like, it's not super beneficial for me, but this is the rules of the game. 
it stuck with me as like the game I enjoyed most as a kid because you could you could then be like, right, so we've got the parameters of like winning and losing and all of that, and we can make our own strategies and we can play all these different scenarios, and it only works because everyone's willing to to succeed and fail within within this game space that we've made um and that was that is super rare amongst kids kids don't like to lose <laughs> like it's an unfortunate reality i think no human likes to lose in fact that's part oh, of no. a lesson that i'm teaching my child right now like when he loses a game and he's sad we're like it's okay you can be sad because he'll be like i'm not sad it's fine it's all right i was like no no, no be sad it's all right. You, I also feel sad when I lose, like appreciate yeah, that know. that's the feeling of it, but it doesn't mean that you can never win. And it doesn't mean that you're bad because you lost. It just means this particular mm. game, you didn't win. That's okay. Let's just, I was like, I get that it stinks. We can feel that. Ugh, gross. Right. All right. Well, so let's move on. You know, like I, yeah. uh, I think that that's the hard part. And in fact, I was going to ask you, when you played this game with these kids, when the people, whoever won, were the final person who bested everyone else with their imaginary guns, how did they act? Was it just like, okay, I won, next round, and like everyone pops up and you just start running around again? Or is there someone who's like, I'm the winner, that's right, everybody, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's the other element that made it work, is we weren't playing competitively, we were playing narratively. Mm. So we were, there was still an element of role-playing to it that meant that like when someone won, it was like, we finally bested the enemy Ugh, playing in character, but it wasn't like I'm the best at this game because there was a mutual understanding that like, this isn't a game that takes any skill. You point your stick that looks a bit like a gun at, at the other person and say, bang, that's not that difficult to do. But by playing by the rules, you could play out these scenarios. And we had things like, you know, cause it's like a war game element. We had hostage situations. We're going to take these people hostage and we can catch them. And then we had the heroic escapes as like, the other team Kate swept in to try and save them. And, and I think there was just like a remarkably good sense of like narrative structure and like uh, l losing it all. And then the catharsis of pulling it back from, from the, the jaws of defeat and all of that. There was way more of that in this group of kids. And I would say probably more so from these other kids we met could not name them, do not remember them only remember this game that we played together. Um, but like, I take a lot from the fact that they they just were like this is what we like this is just what makes it cool and I was younger than them so I was like yeah yeah this is what makes it cool this is this is how we can make it work and I just remember it was it wasn't about like the competitive edge there was no sportsness to it or even like gameness to it it was just the fact that like to create these interesting stories there has to be a, an ability to lose an ability to win to to actually have consequences to an action even if they're not positive for you as an individual when you're in there um so essentially that was i think what made it work is it wasn't there was just a mutual understanding that like the point was not about winning or losing it was not actually a competitive game it was just a framework to tell these interesting stories that existed because there were winning and losing um uh, aspects to it so there was there were stakes because there was a game to be won, but the winning was less important than the journey and the 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 dynamics that existed because of the stakes that we created. And of course, I'm doing this entirely retrospectively. If you'd asked me as a kid, I'd been like, it was really fun to point and say bang, and then them actually dropping to the ground, and then then I got kidnapped, and then but then I got rescued by my teammates, and like. I'm, it's only years later when I still think about that, that I go, oh, maybe this was my first experience of like shedding personal ego to create mutually with other people. But if I said that as a kid, I think my parents might have been like, are you possessed by some kind of demon? Because why are you <laughs> using such long words? <laughs> now, the reason why I always ask people about their childhood is not just to find out like what the activities are, but rather like what stuck with them because yeah i don't remember mm. hardly anything from my childhood but i have a handful of memories and those memories shape the idea of who i think i am and i think that it's not even what really happened when you were a child and you, you know you won't be able to truly digest that or send it you know like tell it in a story right now but 
whatever you remember, whatever like you pull forth. And I mean, like I set you up to be aware that this is a topic that we're going to discuss. Right. So like Mm -hmm. you've wrapped it around your mind a little bit before you discussed it. So I find it fascinating what details a person remembers and what they choose to tell in the story when I ask them. Right. Because Mm -hmm. we're all, trying to process in the moment who we are, how we got here. Um, and I think that this uh, example of this play that you had is a great example, especially since you are led into a life of um, playing improv and, uh, you know, RPGs, as we were discussing earlier. Yeah. Like the idea of world building, the idea of we're a community developing something all at once together, you know, even reenactment groups, you know, that in and of itself, is a specific style of creativity and um since that is what you find yourself in as an adult it makes sense that that's what you would reflect back on right like so if i if i was a singer right now i would be telling you all the times when i remember singing as a child right I, i don't i don't know that singing you know what i mean like i don't know what it is but i've framed my 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 memories into oh it makes total sense right Absolutely, absolutely. And I definitely think that as I've gone on to do creativity later, as mentioning RPGs and improv, the thing that's carried through from that game is this idea that I enjoy forms of creativity where you are almost simultaneously audience and creator in many ways. So you could have that same level of like, I'm having a real emotional reaction to what's going on. Like this thing that's happened in this scene has genuinely surprised me because like, we've collectively discovered it together and it's a twist in the story we've created, but it's, it's happened in front of us. I remember I used to, I was once in a improvised rom-com with some friends of mine. We did it for a short while. It was really, really good. But I remember one scene, it was in rehearsal. It wasn't even on stage where it was in this uh, phone shop and I was playing like the villain character and it was like towards the end of the rom-com where the villain has to get their comeuppance and my character just started like ranting at the protagonist the the male protagonist of 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 the the narrative and like admitted they'd done all these terrible things to ruin this person's life and then the uh you know my co-performer reached towards their ear and pulled out an imaginary bluetooth and was like did you catch that to like the manager and i legitimately went whoa and like had to like take a moment because i was like i was I was in a, uh, that twist I didn't see coming as an audience member, but then also I'm in it. So I, I, I'm i reacting both as a character, but also very, very really as like, what's going on? And and there's something really interesting. I mean, you get it in kind of when you play certain RPGs as well, like because even if you're leading the game, you don't get to control every aspect of it. If I'm writing a story... A twist is something that I'm investing in and I'm going, I hope anyone else who reads this doesn't see this coming. Or if I am creating a character, I'm going, I hope I, you know, I'm nurturing this character and watching them go through. But if you play more of like a tabletop RPG, you're creating the boundaries for other people to play their own characters within. So there are still things that are out of your control that you could be like, oh, they've just done something that's really interesting. That's so interesting in their character. And and you almost get lost in the fact that you're simultaneously experiencing this story and also playing a major part in the engine that keeps it going. Man, that is a great synthesis of the like sort of excitement that comes from improv and RPGs, this idea of being both performer and audience all in one moment. Like, and I also love the idea that this like big moment that you're thinking of, that's like an example of a, of a great moment for you was in rehearsal like that. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that there are, I was in a musical improv troupe and there is a show that we did in rehearsal one time that I still think is the best show we ever did. And we did tons of shows and everyone, I loved them. They were great. It was a great crowd, but I still think about this one in rehearsal. And it was like the only person that saw it was our coach. Like the idea of that is, but it was still amazing. I still think about it. Right. So it was for us, you know, we are the performer, but we're also the audience. We like appreciated that. We're like, yeah, man, we did it, you know? 
And I think um, to suddenly get weirdly more philosophical all of a sudden, but that idea of art being way more private and way more intimate and incredibly temporary is something that's becoming more and more common as we go more into the modern age. I was trying to talk about Snapchat, weirdly enough, an, an app that's not really current or relevant um, at the moment. I don't know. I don't think. I don't understand young people. I'm getting to that age now where I'm no longer <laughs> considered young. Um, but uh, it's almost like I remember when everyone was using Snapchat loads, and I remember feeling like, oh, this is really interesting because you can spend a lot of time creating a post on Snapchat that is only going to last 24 hours. But people still invest a lot of time in what they, or it's only going to one other person. But people still invest in getting a photo that they really like and putting maybe a music on it or what what gifts they stick on it, knowing it's going to disappear and never be found again. But in while we're all really connected and 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 we're constantly bombarded with media from everywhere and you know it's this feeling that art is kind of shallow because it's really overproduced etc etc there's something really nice about the fact that we create these tiny mini pieces of art that we just flick towards each other and then they're gone as soon as they're seen so it's almost returning to what you could argue art used to be which is almost this form of conversation around the the fire in terms of i'm going to tell you a story and and you will hear it and everyone around this fire will hear it. And some of you may even go on to retell it, but it will probably be different. It will probably be unique. And and this moment will never be recreated. This telling of this story, you've got a guitar, you're going to play some music with it, or we're going to sing a song afterwards. But it is entirely unique within this moment. Mm. And then it will you know, blow away on the wind, as it were. And we don't get that much anymore in in media or in art because everything's super permanent like you say one thing and it's somewhere on the internet forever and there's something really nice about creating artwork that can never really be understood outside of the context that it existed in and that's the case with improv when you go to the improv show it's a very famous thing of like oh you just had to be there because it was really really funny but it was because of how it happened in that one show but i think there's something even more powerful about knowing that there are shows that are really strong that you only ever share with that one group of improvisers that you work with, because they're also your friends. So it's in many ways, it's 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 a very weirdly intimate moment to have a really powerful, really good show that has loads of really funny moments, but it's just you and your fellow performers in a room practicing, and then suddenly you create something great, and you go, this will only ever be experienced or have been experienced by us in the room. Yeah. There's a lot to take in as far as, like, um, what the Snapchat sort of short pieces that we're sharing with each other, like, mean. I, I feel like your reference to the idea that there's this permanence to everything, you know, you put something on the, on the Internet, it's there forever. You know, you take this photo, it's in digital form forever. And then we create this art that has this, you know momentary life and it's the fleeting nature of it that makes it extra special or it like because it goes away it like makes it more almost like when there's a, like limited edition you know what i mean mm. like there's there's something extra about it that makes it different than other things um and i feel like that's the intention and perhaps how it will be taken but Personally, from a let's look at it from farther away view, I think everything's impermanent about our um, our world right now as far as like, like the internet is hilarious that everyone is like, oh, it's permanent. No, it's not. Like, like you think that there isn't a significant amount of stuff, even just legitimate like deprecation of files, like even just the basic idea of it, like it's not permanent it's permanent for a couple a couple more years than it used to be you know it, it's more than newsprint for sure information yeah. gets passed around much quicker i'll give you that but like the news cycle is fast i mean think about things you know even if you were to write down every day the like news story that is a big deal that day a week later you'd look at that and be like oh my god remember when that happened like it's mm. just like everything is so fast and so wild that I feel like Snapchat super fast stuff just made sense. 
Yeah. Even absolutely. the idea of like the idea of TikTok following up on Vine, like Vine didn't do well, not because it wasn't hugely popular, but because it's tough to run an internet company. And like, mm-hmm. you know, that's the other part that I feel like a lot of us learned during the pandemic is it's like, you know, there's a lot of factors to whether or not something exists or not. And sometimes it's just like, it's hard to run a business and that business yeah. stopped. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like Vine wasn't amazing and everyone was super into it. Clearly they are. They're doing short videos again on TikTok. You know, it's the exact same creative output. But at the same time, like, it's just a different interface. It's like somebody took Vine and was like, let me change it slightly. But Vine just didn't last in a business, art business kind of way. Um, Because to circle back to the other thing we were talking about, there's all this, like, money involved and, like, oh, this audience has to agree that this thing is a worthwhile business to run when it's, like, Sometimes I'm like, guys, we're artists. We're literally building your culture for you. I'm so sorry you're upset about it, but it, it it's happening. <laughs> like, and, and I think because I, I, I think it's a really good point, and this idea of like, uh, yeah, the weight that's put on some of these things it, it brings me back to improv, um, and so I do improv in the UK, and I do improv outside of like a major city in the UK. Sheffield is a a city but i would you know it's got manchester nearby and obviously london where so much of cultural stuff will gravitate towards and some more is coming to manchester but sheffield really is kind of outside of it's not a city where you would go and live if you were looking to become a professional actor for example like there isn't a huge amount of access to paid work there you would probably still be traveling to london most of the time so how we build an improv seems really really interesting because we don't have, even if we wanted to, we don't have necessarily the capacity to be like, hey, come join our improv theatre because we taught the British equivalent of Amy Poehler. Like, we don't have that um, uh, star factor that I, you know, that there are beginning to grow some of that in certain UK ones. And I know that the big schools in America, it's it's uh, selling on the biggest name style of approach so i actually did my dissertation my master's all about how improv communities have built and how there's this huge thing about leveled classes because you want to grow in your skill and to do that you want to do level one and then level two and then level three and and britain we don't that's not been as embedded in the way that we do things yet but it has very much been the assumed state of things. So there is still plenty of that. But it's early enough that I think if enough people within British improv went, no, no, we don't want to do it that way, then people just wouldn't. They would just go, oh, oh, cool, we'll, we'll try some different ways. Because not enough people have, there are some, but not a critical mass of people have built their entire income off that structure. And it all comes to this idea of putting money to it, that the one way that that, training center style of improv has shown that it works is for the people who run it they can develop i would describe it as a, as a living wage off it i'm not going to try and claim that there are these green fat cats at the top of these organizations uh certainly not in the uk but probably not in america as well the arts don't ever make enough money to describe anyone as as just being greedy within the, those jobs because they're often doing everything they can just to scrape by and spend all the time doing improv but the problem is, is you know, you're building essentially, a, 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 I don't want to use the term pyramid, but like a, a, a hierarchical structure where the money goes from the bottom up to the teachers and then up to the, the owners of the theatres. And, and it, it's not great. And it has a lot of uh, both sustainability issues in terms of what happens when that community either you run out of new people to learn it for the first time. So you don't have any bottom rung anymore. So everyone sees themselves as a certain level of good. So you can't sell the 101 classes. The minimum you can sell is 102. Then suddenly people are like, well, actually, I want to go off and do improv in my own way. And you have to make a decision like, do I lock down people's ability to do improv outside of our community? I've seen it happen in the UK. I've heard stories about happening in America where it's like, financially, I need you to do this under our umbrella because the brand needs to continue to thrive. Otherwise, this this all crumbles. And then there's also the ethical things of like, hierarchies have famously over the years had really dodgy things happen 
because of them, but they exist because people are trying to make their wage. They're trying to continue to be able to live a, a life of basic level of, of, of existing and be able to spend their whole time doing improv, especially because if you start running something like that, you need to be dedicating a certain amount of your time to it as well. And this is something I've really wrestled with is this idea of like, I wanted to do improv when I kind of came out of uni. That's why I wanted to spend my time doing. But then as I began to walk along that path, I was like, if I start doing this professionally, I'm going to start feeling really weird about improv. And I'm going to have to start thinking about it in, to link back to what we're saying about in a more permanent sense, thinking about the longevity of it, thinking about making it last, thinking about making it sustainable for me as an individual making money, but also because I was, you know, in my early 20s and there was a real thing in my head about this idea of legacy. What do I want to leave behind? I, I want to be in some way important in the years to come, which is a big theatre thing. Creatives are like, I don't just want to spend my time doing something I enjoy. I want to be the person that people are like, is this the, have they recreated this entire creative form? Is this the the person that people are going to associate with this art form, this country going forward? I definitely had the, an element of that, of being like, I want to be a name in the future. And it's why now I'm fascinated with this idea of 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 temporal temporalness and things being really short lived. Because now I'm like, I just I want to go and create something and have that time to decompress. And the stuff that I do in terms of organizational stuff, I just like to build spaces that I can then go and do weird, stupid things on stage. And then have a laugh with some friends and then go for a drink afterwards. And if if it eventually fizzles out, it existed and it was great in the time that it existed. And if it goes on to something else, great, there's another cool thing that I can get involved in. Um, but I've I've gone through a process basically over the last probably actually the pandemic is what finished this arc I was going through, which was there is no way to guarantee any any project's going to survive. So just enjoy it while it exists. We had a, I ran a, a regular improv show that was essentially killed off by the pandemic. And I realized I didn't feel sad. And I was like, why not? This is like something I've put loads of time into. And I was like, well, because it died a hero. Like we, we <laughs> were really enjoying it. And we got a moment to then be like, it's ended because of a huge world event. So we could just, be like that was really cool and it now can stay in the space where it's really cool and it wasn't dragged out to the point where it was causing me loads of stress or i was having to start thinking about oh how do i make more money from this so we can expand or it it died before my brain could hyper fixate on it in that way and it could just be what it was yeah it's really hard um because you're right there is this sort of like pull for longevity you know, especially in what's really funny is I find it more in um, improv groups than like theater groups, which is funny because improv is like literally built on this idea of a fleeting moment. And it's like you'd think we'd all be a lot more easygoing about short term mm -hmm. stuff, you know, but I feel like it's like, yeah, listen, on stage, I'm fine with it being a fleeting moment, but this troupe is going to be a troupe forever. You know, like I think about how many troops I've had and how when they ended, like I'm still sad about the musical improv one that ended, you know, I mean, like, I still think about it yeah. some days and I'm like, <sighs> like, could it have worked out? No, absolutely not. Like half the people live in different states or different countries now. Like we're not, you know, there's no way, but you know, you want is to hold on to something. It's like, you can't appreciate something unless you think it's going to last forever. I mean, I think that's a larger cultural thing, but, um, but the idea of like, creating something where you can just have fun, I think is wonderful. And I really, the thing that it sounds like you have the skills to do the admin, to do the infrastructure work. And I feel like I have that skill as well. And sometimes I have seen a thousand times people who do not have that skill being the people in charge of stuff. And I'm always like, Oh, Hey, could I help? Because I know, certain things to do and like just like I'm organized right and I think that if you have that skill that it is a rare 
rare skill. That it is a thing that artists in general don't have, right? Which is also why we're wild and searching for communities and creating projects that make no sense until finally you find another person who makes it similarly and you're like, wait, what? Like, whereas, you know, if you have this skill to be organized and you can help, I really, I think it's absolutely... Like, please help those people. <laughs> they need you. Mm. You have a special and, and, skill. <laughs> I mean, so, because I did, I, I kind of went to go get that skill. I did my master's in arts and cultural management, which was all about this idea of running these kind of organizations. And I kind of went, I, particularly in improv, keep bumping into people who are like, I really wish we could get more arts council funding, for example. Um, I, I realize this might be a, a very specific, but in the UK, we have a whole government-funded group that will give money to certain artistic projects. And that sounds like, nice. I, it's, it's lovely. Um, there's a lot of controversy over what we will and won't fund, but, you know, it's still better than not having it at all. And um, Sure. And they're like, oh, just no one, no one, uh, the Arts Council won't give money to improv. And I'm like, I feel like that's not true, but I can't really state why because I don't know how the Arts Council works. And I eventually just went, I'm just going to go and like learn more about this and also set myself up so that I can continue working in the general arts area while being slightly more likely to hold down like full-time jobs. Because when you go into the admin side of theatre, it's a lot easier. Well, no, not a lot easier. It's a little easier to find jobs that will pay like a nine to five because... Yeah. Theatres need administrators to work nine to five. Um, a little easier, but you'll notice that admins have a tendency to get a job at a theater and work there for twenty years. So if you're in the town where there's already an admin at the theater, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you just got to sit and wait and do other sort of periphery work until that position comes up, and then you throw everything at it. Uh, especially because <laughs> if you're in a position like me, where Moving's not really an option. I uh, I didn't do this to then go to London and do loads of London right. stuff. Like I wanted to do this in Sheffield, but that does mean there's like five jobs in this kind of area, and they're currently all like I'm waiting for someone to move or uh, retire, and I'm just kind of sat there twiddling my thumbs, like, oh, you've you've had this job a while, haven't you? Oh, there must be so much else out there for you, not for me. I I, I just want <laughs> your job, um, <laughs> but like I found that what was really interesting is I kind of went into it being like, Oh, and maybe I could look at how, how, how I can make improv maybe like a source of income. And I came out the other end of the masters and went, Oh, I've learned that. That's not what I want to do. I want to make my money elsewhere to allow me to do improv in the way that I want to do it. Mm. And I firmly believed that it being in any way, my primary form of income would cause me severe barriers. And I would then start doing things that I, don't want to do with Im- improv like it would have to change my attitude towards it it would have to change my approach towards it i really enjoy so i i was brought on to the thing i'm currently working on is sas spontaneity and sheffield steel uh which was originally set up by a friend of mine called Owen scrivens who's amazing and a really cool improviser and he moved to sheffield and he's a doctor like trade and he was like i want to set up like a an improv drop in and i was like oh cool well i will help you in the way that i feel like i have the most unique skill to bring in which is i'll help you design uh like social media images and a flyer and uh i'll give you advice on like when other things currently run and when it might be a good like time and like time of day and to, to run in and, and kind of give you a lay of the land because you come into the city and like it's always helpful to know what else is already happening so you can kind of build things in and then i just got really into the fact that this existed and this is exactly what i've been looking for at the time started getting really, really involved and was like do you want to just help me run it and i was like yes please um <laughs> just got really really excited by it and there was this huge element of I can bring all these skills to this thing, but like also look at ways that we can run it in the genuinely the best interest for the community, which isn't always the most profitable way of running things. And I think that became, that's become something that we've both really emphasized is like, 
as long as we can cover basic costs of like room cover and all of that um i ne we never want to make decisions that promote increasing our income even to a sense of oh so we can do more things like we would always want to make sure that what we're doing is in the community's benefit first to keep it being an accessible and just fun place to be yeah, it gets really hard um, when they're like, I feel like this is a theme of the entire thing we've talked about. When money gets involved, it really kind of messes with the creative output. It like makes you have to change. Um, it makes you have to make decisions based on what you think the audience wants. Like what kind of show did they want to come to? Like there was a theater that I worked at and they put up this show. Like the whole essence was that everyone was able to be on stage like the idea when we were talking about what does this theater stand for was like everyone has a chance to get on our stage da, da, da. and then they put on this show that was a popular show from another theater where stand-ups would go up and then they would get the audience to heckle them and they could really heckle them hard and yeah. the idea was that the stand-up had to withstand that and it, it was like watching this like cacophonous insanity and i was like I don't, we need to not have this show anymore at our theater because it is antithetical to the vibe that we are putting out there. Like we cannot have this show. And they were like, what are you talking about? It sells out every time. And I was like, yeah, that's great. Let it sell out somewhere else. It's not our vibe. We can't have this here. This does not promote what we're trying to promote. And that was a like a big discussion, like for a while before they finally were like, all right, We'll, we'll cancel it and send them to another place. It was like, guys, it's insane during this show. It gets really angry and violent in the theater space. And it's not what we want to have in our space. Like, especially because we were a BYOB place. So everyone has beer and they're drinking and it's getting crazier and crazier and everyone mm -hmm. like re allowing people to release this negative energy just like made them act very badly and they were like really were cruel and wild and like some of them it got physical and I was like no no that guy pushed the comedian we cannot have this at all like you know and finally they're like fine I guess we'll get rid of it but it was held on to because it was making money because it was bringing yeah. in a bunch of money. People would fill up the theater to watch this show, to see this insanity, right? Yeah. People like the Coliseum too, where they're murdering people. That's not, that's not the show I'd like to have on. Right. I feel like, and the other part about improv, which is so hard, improv is great, but mostly the only people that like improv are improvisers, right? So it's yeah. not really like a big crowd pleasing show. Like some people will go and there are a solid handful of wonderful humans who like watching it, but not performing it. And those humans are like nurses and people who care for the elderly. Like these are kind hearted humans, you know, not a lot of them, not a lot of them around because improv, when you perform it, you get to be kind hearted and fun, but also like, like the lady on stage, like, so you get both. Right. And so it can't make that much money because who's watching the show. In fact, the best audience you could hope for is other improvisers. Right. And they're probably not going to pay. Cause they're like, they were the show before, or like, you know what I mean? Like they already work there, you know? So it's never going to make money. The ideal that you're looking for is not a lucrative ideal. And it is so hard to get to that place. In fact, I love that you guys have money that you can get to create these because like, yeah, just create this sort of community space where it's like, come and play and have fun. Then we'll laugh at each other's jokes and then we'll all go have a beer and go home at the end of the day. Like that sounds like, you know, they used to have social clubs. It sounds like what that really is. Right. And if only, and, and now we're bogged down by this idea, man, I am fascinated to, um, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I'm like, dude, can I read your thesis? Like, I want to know what, you know, Le like legitimately, I need to reread it at some point because it was two years ago now and I forgot <laughs> the details of it, but like, <laughs> what did I say? I was, it, it was really interesting because, um, <laughs> what I did was I interviewed like a couple of, uh, like fairly established, uh, improv, communities 
uh, from like the UK. So I think I interviewed someone from like the Bristol Improv Theatre and Miss Imp and just asked them about like it was like a couple of individuals from like the decision making teams within that. Asked them like how do you do what you do? How do you make decisions? And I, I was like really I raised this idea of like the training center model, which is like the term I used for like the classic style of, of uh, improv theatre. And then I also asked similar questions, obviously without the training center model, uh, of a uh, established art space here in Sheffield and a amateur dramatics group here in Sheffield and ask them questions about how do you keep sustainable? How do you like maintain audiences and just keep like some of the fundamental things you need to do just to qualify doing what they do. And uh, the answers were really, really interesting. And I think particularly when you look at the amateur dramatics group, because that's where everything changes because everyone doesn't do it for money. It suddenly changes the dynamics in so many interesting ways because on one hand, it's like, we're not doing it for money, so we don't have to worry about earning a certain amount of profit just to be able to keep going. It's, we only have to break even. But on the other hand, it's like people who don't do things for money don't always necessarily do things for like purely good reasons. And I think that's something I found really interesting about it is like you have these other issues of like suddenly you find that i know that the group i interviewed they were like we found that we couldn't get newer members to commit in the same way as like our older members did because just the pressures on them have completely changed and they want opportunity to come and get up on stage but like we need people to commit the rest of the time because there's non-glamorous roles that we need people to be willing to fulfill. We need people backstage. We need people building set. We need people coming and hoovering the rehearsal room that we own, like, because that needs doing. And, like, you need people to volunteer for all aspects of things. People need to be willing to come and just sell tickets as well. And if the main appeal that you're putting out there is, like, we're going to get up on stage and get a chance to perform, you're not nurturing a community that will be willing to stay after that has happened and do all the other important stuff as well. And I think what's really interesting is it's sometimes the same for improv, is if you don't have, if people aren't feeling like either they're making money from it or they're learning a skill that they can later make money from, if there's not this sense of like, maybe one day I could do this as a job, what else are they doing it for? Which sometimes it's just to have fun, but sometimes it's not. And sometimes there is this social thing of like, oh, I don't need to make money from it, but I still need to be the best. And I still need to feel validated by doing this. And so I'm still going to build the way I do improv around, uh, no, we don't need a money hierarchy because no one's making money, but there still needs to be a hierarchy because I still need to feel like I'm leading my own little community. And then it comes back to what we talked about, this idea about legacy they want to build something that they feel they've built and they own and that becomes more important than than the thing in itself and so it, it comes back to this whole idea of like okay no we don't have to make money but we have to make something it has to be something that lasts it has to have a legacy and that means that you start approaching things in terms of like you're doing something for my legacy you're your involvement is part of my legacy. You know, we're going to keep this group, as you were saying earlier, we're going to keep this group going forever. And in many ways, the longevity of it is about this idea of like, oh, I've been in an impro the same improv group for 10 years and we've grown over that time and now we're known across the world because we've done all these festivals. The glamour is almost what appeals to them, even if they're not making money. But again, as we, we've discussed, that will still peter out in some way or another, we will eventually all become too old to maintain an, a, a long-term improv group. And there's no guarantee that if one of us steps away, that group will keep going. So why not just do a show and then go, we'll all come together, we'll get ready, we'll do a show. And then maybe we'll do another show afterwards, but we don't need to maintain this sense of cohesive group identity constantly because people's lives constantly change and they can't commit to 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 the same thing for the same amount of time um mm. and so it all kind of links back to this idea how do you build something sustainable not only on an economic level of 
we need to make sure we can keep affording this. But on a social level, in terms of people's investment will change and people will fluctuate in terms of how much time they can give to something. I mean, I'm this year, I bought a house and I'm getting married, did it in the same year. God knows why, but like, <laughs> it, it, I know why I did each thing individually. It's just them c- coinciding in the same year. I don't have the same level. If I was in a, like a performing improv troupe this year, I would be like, oh my God, I have to quit this group because I can't give the level of time that's needed to be a part of this group. But that comes from this idea of like, got to preserve it. It's got to stay the same. Everything has to kind of like live on rather than going, well, you know, everyone's really busy at the moment. So let's just let it disband and maybe we'll come back and do a different thing. And that will be even cooler. And we gave ourselves the space to do that because we weren't, we weren't trying to hold every single improv group we've ever been involved with as this indefinite thing that we just keep doing and keep doing and keep doing. Yeah. I wonder how much of it, how much of it has to do with the sort of the cultural ideas kind of to even go back to our cultural idea of impermanence, you know, that there's so much that we feel like is changing that we're searching for that one thing, you know, um, I recently listened to, uh, it was like an interview with a sociologist or something about how we're all trying to find like groups and tribes and we're trying to like create an us versus them. And it, as much as, you know, your intelligent brain might be able to be like, no, you don't have to do that. We're our monkey brain makes us do it. Like we're like, we're in groups. I'm in this group, you know, and there's something safe to the monkey brain, to the like idea of like, I found this place. I'm now safe. I'm in my tribe. I'm in my group. You know, this is who I'm going to travel with, you know, this kind of thing. And our world isn't like that anymore. Our world is like, you know, they used to live until the age of 40 and then like, that was it. So it like makes sense. If you live 40 years and that's it, I can see how you can be like, yeah, I'm going to work a while to find a spot where I feel comfortable and then I'm going to hang there. Great. Good call. But now we live to like 80, 90, right? We got a couple, couple activities, couple cities. Uh, now we're mobile. You know, we don't have to live in the same town. You know, you're like, oh, I just bought this house. I want to stay here in Sheffield. Great. Maybe you will. But by the time you're your grandfather's age in your mid 80s, who knows where you'll be? I mean, like you could do anything. You know, there could and be any just... move. And and the idea that you could is great and amazing, but also super scary because it's like, wait, that means I have to end this X part of my life and move on. But it's like, you know, like I went to college or I told you earlier, I'm from Boston. I lived in Boston until I was 18. Then I moved away. I haven't lived there again, you know, but that's a part of my life. You know what? Wild new part, you know. And I think uh, just building off the idea of like, the potential of moving, I, you know, I, I hit a point where I was like, oh my God, I, like I am committed to living in the city. Like, am I losing out on more of the experiences of new places? And then I went back to where I grew up in Stockport and I realized how entirely different it felt going back. And I was like, oh, even if you stay in the same city your entire life, you're not staying in the same place because the place changes around you. And, uh, you know, within 20 years, Sheffield will not look the same as it does right now. And and that transforms. And again, talking about this idea of trying to hold on, trying to hold on to permanence when everything's just changing at like super fast rate right around us makes sense. But it's also this idea of, you know, it makes me think of the the thing that they say about you know if you get caught in a skid on ice, they say lean into the skid because if you try and pull away, that's where things get crazy and that's where you end up losing control even more whereas if you steer into the skid that's where you can regain control and to a certain extent i actually sometimes think you know am i just trying to gain a level of control over my life by embracing how little permanence actually exists and not doing anything for a long amount of time like and i don't abandon projects but i just i really don't mind if something dissipates as yeah. long as we had fun doing it yeah plus like each individual project is sometimes just like an inspiration to the next one right like i do all of the this whole podcast that i'm doing is different talks with different artists every 
single conversation is different for me, for them, and also for the people who are listening. And But each one is part of a larger idea, right? But it's changed. It's been going on for five years. The first episode was not like this at all. You know, like like the whole vibe of it, you know, like recently I wrote like a whole uh, history of how it developed and changed. And I was like, oh my God, I had no idea how much it had changed. And not just because I used to have co-hosts and now I don't, but like just literally even just the vibe of how we talk and how we get into it. And like the different kinds of like people that I'm talking to about what I'm talking, you know, like it's, Everything is different and it's, it's like, let it evolve. You know, if I were insistent that everything stayed, what if I like quit doing this right after my like last co-host was like, yeah, I'm really sorry. I like can't do this anymore. And we're like, all right, I guess that's it. You know what I mean? Like that was like three years ago. I was just like, well, maybe I can do this at home while I get the, you know, I had a child there, you know, I was like, while he's asleep in the other room, I'll just talk to people right it was just like it evolved right and you gotta allow yeah. yourself to evolve and you're right about the city that you live in like i've now lived in i realize i now lived in austin texas for uh, 12 years crazy 12 years how long is that that's a lot and how different the city is how different i am all the different adventures and jobs like i was just reminiscing with my husband about like this work christmas party that we went to together and i was like oh my god remember when i worked there oh Oh my God. Mm. Like it just seems everything is so, you know, you just have to go with the flow and man, the lean into the skid thing blew my mind. Like I was like, Oh my God, I needed to hear that. Like, Oh my, maybe you do need to. Oh, wow. Yeah. I I mean, cause you never know. Everything's changing. Everything's evolving. Like, and you kind of just have to let it be. And, and I'm always, because I'm a storyteller and you may maybe do this too, but, I'm always looking for the lesson. I'm always like, mm. okay, I don't love this, but where? what do I need to take away from this? Like before I feel like something's ending, I'm like, I t- try to, because <laughs> everything's a television show. I try to make it have like a moral of the story. <laughs> yeah, so I like figure absolutely. out what I have to learn, you know? And and the thing is as well, something I've realized is uh, I've sometimes done the exact same thing and I've gone, what's the lesson from this? And then I realize it's a lesson that I've already identified. And I go, I didn't learn that lesson. This is like the sitcom where they just repeat the same <laughs> storyline where the character just defaults back to their old thing and you go, oh, that's so unrealistic. But here I am doing it where I learn... You know, I'd already learned to check an employee, like an employer, before going and working there and make sure it's actually a good fit before jumping in. But here I am again in a workplace that doesn't quite vibe, and I, I've i learned that, oh, you should double check before you go and work into a workplace. So, uh, you know, but it, it happens, and that's why I, I laugh whenever anyone says, oh, it's so unrealistic how uh, characters in sitcoms, they, like, learn something, but by the next episode, they're right back to how they were. And I'm like, have you met people? People do that all the time. <laughs> people know. like... People, like, get to the end of an arc and go, like, oh, I've truly learned that this is what I need to do in the future, and then immediately don't do that anymore. <laughs> like, immediately revert on my lesson. And it kind of all comes back to this idea of, like, momentariness. It's like, I do that. I will learn a lesson, and I try and see this as part of, like, it's that permanent narrative of my own life, in a, in a way, that also doesn't exist we talk we sometimes you think about this idea of nothing's permanent so you therefore assume everything's linear and that everything's going in a direction towards the like to in a very clear way towards something but it's not that either it can be six steps back and you can find yourself in a creative place where you feel like you're doing less than you were doing but again it's just because the whole world around you is different the people that you're surrounded with are different the city's changed that venue used to use for loads of your shows has gone up in price or doesn't take shows anymore or has changed management or has closed down yada 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 like we try to use within our own life like really either this idea of permanence and holding like a sitcom or like this ongoing progressive serial show that we're all going to learn and then eventually there'll be this finale where everything comes to a conclusion because everything's been leading in that direction but life is more like i don't know a series of like short films in the wrong order um with characters that turn up and then disappear completely at random like it's 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 really 
disjointed. And I think one of the things I realize in myself as a creative is when I try and bottle it in the narrative structures that I understand or, or this sense of permanence uh, rolling story that I understand is always the point that I end up disappointing myself because things don't progress in that way. So my uh, anyone who's listening this far into the episode will laugh that it took me this long to bring it up because this conversation has been begging for my theories. I have a theory of our cycle of life, right? And if you listen yeah. to any episode in previous to this, then you've uh, 100% uh, heard this theory. Yeah, yeah. So when you're talking about like how we progress, I have this theory that we become new people every 18 years, that like our cycle of like development is an 18 year development. And that like, that's how long we should give ourselves. And I developed it not because I like truly believe like there's going to be some science backup for me in this like theory that I have. I say it because I feel like we give ourselves a hard time for, you know, like you're saying, trying to create this linear story for ourselves and everything. And I think that you can, but you have to at some point let that storyline go and start a new show. Like your season of, you know, like, like it was like Amy, Amy's childhood. It was a great time. Zero to 18. She enjoyed herself. She lived in Boston. I don't know if you heard all these cool people. Her mom and dad were fun. Um, all sorts of fun stuff. But then after 18, Amy's story changed. She moved to Texas. Like it was a whole new world and she was by herself. And it was like, I got to figure out who I was and what's going on. And I, I feel like I also developed it because I'm in my 40s now and I feel like after you turn 40, culture lets you go. Like they're like, well, you're old now. There you are. And you're like, what? Uh, but I'm going to be alive for another full length of this. Like I'm 40, but I'm definitely going to be every woman in my family line has died at 88. I got 48 to go. I got yeah. time. Right. Can we talk about this? No, no longer is anyone concerned about what your thoughts are. Right. But you're still living your life. And so I just think that like we're all going through journeys of whatever new becoming we are, whatever new person. And it's like a larger lesson, you know, like sometimes during that time you're doing things like getting married and buying a house. These are things that you're like, this is a goal I have. Can I accomplish this goal? Let's try. And then you do and then you learn from it. You move on, right? In when you turn, I don't know how old you are, but it's like the next round you're at, right? Say the next one you're, I don't know if you're in your 18 to 36 or you're 36 to 54, but let's say when you're 54, you buy a new house, you sell this house, you buy a new one, right? It's like the, you finish one chapter and start a new chapter, whatever it might be that changes you. You know, sometimes it's just everything stays the same, but you feel different. You know, I see that happens. It's like you'll notice in their mid 50s, your friends are going to start buying sports cars or like getting divorced. And you're like, no, no, no. Hey, you don't have to throw everything away from your previous cycles. You just need to like know that you are on some new psychological, philosophical journey that you're going to figure or something else out right and I don't think we give ourselves the chance to allow for that and so I, I essentially created this as a way for people to make themselves feel better on their journeys like if they're feeling low it's like hey man don't worry about it would you be sad you meet a child from zero to 18 as they're growing up when your friends kids you meet them you're gonna be mad at them because they haven't figured something out oh this five-year-old hasn't figured out how to ride a bike i can't believe them kick them out no we all have skills they, some things work some things don't you know same with artists same with adults you know hey man he's been working at this company for five years he hasn't figured x out yeah but he's figured y z a b c d x you know like he's pretty good at some things you know whatever the mm -hmm. thing is we're all on journeys and i i don't know no, <laughs> there i, I go it. everyone so get into it in in uh, in preparation for this episode, I went and listened to some more episodes. I listened to the last one where I think it was the last episode, um, <laughs> certainly when we are recording, you mentioned it as well. And I, I remember sitting there and going, yeah, yeah, like that makes complete sense. So I'm 28, so I'm just over the halfway point of Great. season two. I'm, oh, I'm going to start one. using the season terminology, but yeah, it's good. just over halfway season two. And I'm, one of the distinct things I've noticed about this age is you've just gone over the precipice of a lot of people within certainly the industry I work stop going, Oh my God, you're so young. 
that's just stopped. <laughs> Whereas no one would try and argue that I wasn't necessarily young, but I stopped that stopped being a qualifier in my professional like journey. Yeah. When I talk to a lot of other professionals, people will dismiss concerns I have if you know, if I go about five years ago, people were like, Oh, you're still young, like whatever. And I I know that is still <laughs> the case, but it stopped being the dismissive thing people will be like oh well you know 28 is not that old but i've noticed that shift i've gone from like you have no problems because of the age that you are to well don't feel too old you are still technically young Uh, and (laughs) while it's the same thing it's a distinct change and i I feel like that that shift i noticed because i stopped having that comfort blanket of like oh you know uh, 21 that's that's essentially still a child 23 that's essentially 21 oh 25 <laughs> that's essentially 23 and now I'm 28 i'm like okay i'm closer to 30 now than you know most other key ages um so you know there's 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 a sense of like the 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 sun is setting on season two almost <laughs> although not quite now that i do the maths but like yeah, but you're uh, developing a thing that you've been working on. You're in yeah. the midst of it. You're not at the beginning. You don't know. Maybe I'll do this. You have been working on this idea. Even, heck, the, the master's program. You're still in the development of this idea. You're still in the research part of your life of figuring out what the best way to connect with the culture is what the best way to create art is and how you can help and don't get me wrong i guarantee you by the time you are 36 you will have done something for sheffield art that will then make it different like that will be the new dawn of something because you care because you're working on it because you're there and your heart is in it and because of that the change will come people will just you see somebody who cares about something i don't care if i don't care about that at all if i'm like see how excited they are i'm like yeah what is it great awesome like i just want to support your excitement you know and i feel like that is what will buoy your you know, figuring out, you're helping this development, you're also researching, you're talking to people, how could we make this better? I mean, even just the sheer effort of it is like amazing because so many people are like, let's just run a theater. And you're like, have you read any level of how to run a business Mm -hmm. or how to run an arts business or no, none of that? Okay, great. I'm sure it'll go well. You know, you're doing so much research. You're like, you know, so you have so much knowledge based on all this work that you've done that your involvement in this scene will inherently help. Even if you're not actively going out there and being like, let me teach you how to do culture. Like you're knowing what's going on and doing stuff will shape the world that you're in. And, you know, maybe you'll accomplish some goal in your head around then and then move on to the next bit, you know? Uh, absolutely. And I, I, I have already noticed that myself and kind of my peers who kind of did improv at the same time, me, people I work with have had an impact because I was part of a group of people who did improv in Sheffield who then didn't move. Cause when I originally came to Sheffield, I did it as part of the university. There was this running treadmill of people who came, did it for three years as part of the university group and then left. And part of the effect of that is there wasn't much improv in the city outside of the universities, but then myself and uh, you know, a collective of people who did improv with me decided, no, oh, we're going to stay in Sheffield. We're going to do improv. And a critical mass happened so that that could be a thing. You know, there was enough people who were all willing to, even if we just come together and do improv, well, you know, we have we have a reason to do it together. And that meant that there was a place to come and do it if you weren't a student, which was a, a tipping point. Like, that was, that was a key thing. And this is the other thing is, like, it kind of when people talk about this idea of how do I have an impact? How do I like do something within? And I think people really have it in improv as well. Cause there's this idea that improv certainly in Britain is quite small. So therefore having a large impact is somewhat easier. So people start thinking about what kind of impact do I want to have? And I, I think it's something that you just have by bringing yourself to the table and, you know, 
leaving the door open for other people to come in as well, but being like, here's who I am, here's what, here are my values, here's what I believe. And, you know, I'm not going to agree with everyone. We're going to bump heads on this thing. We're going to have disagreements on this thing. But, like, eventually, when the dust settles from us all coming together and going, what, what's this going to be? You know, how, how are we going to do improv in this area? Then you're going to have something that will be distinct and, and be kind of set aside. And I love talking to people who do improv across the world because the level of, like, vibe that changes and like the difference in style of humor and just social approach is just so radically different absolutely absolutely it is definitely um it is definitely great to talk to people all over and to find out their different the different ways that they run it um certainly in your cultural research like the idea of mm. all these different communities and the way that they run has to be fascinating from the work that you've already done like god your brain just must soak it up in such an amazing way and i think the theory will never be as good as the practice. So I had the absolute honor of working with a previous interview of the show, David Escobedo, on his PhD, where he oh, ran great. a Zoom, uh, like, improv project. We just brought together four people from, I think, two were from the UK and two were from across the international scene. There weren't, it was, it was, but I think it was India and, like, Bangladesh were the other two improvisers. And we just did some improv together and then did like a mini show on his Facebook and and then that was it. And we had the funnest time. And it was also fascinating on like a cultural studies level because it was like different decisions that were made in scenes. So like we there was a scene where the suggestion was shower and so me and the other British improvisers started doing what we would expect with a shower where we're like wiping down our arms and we we imagining the water coming from above and then there was a pause from the other two and they were clearly deciding something and then eventually they started sharing but with this idea of like a bowl that they were pouring over themselves if i remember correctly and it was just this cultural difference of an understanding of what that word meant and the associations with it and we talked about it for ages afterwards in terms of like it was just a it didn't interrupt it wasn't abrasive we weren't both going oh i couldn't do this because you had a different idea of what this thing was it was it we just we carried on through the scene no one really recognized that there was this huge difference but then afterwards we got to have this huge conversation about like the differences in assumptions that we made and and you know there was definitely they were probably doing more work than me and the other british person because on the simple level the workshop was in english and everyone spoke english in there and they were like they were speaking english as a second language whereas we were speaking as a first so there was there was always going to be a level of like it was being run by an english speaker so there was going to be that slight imbalance but it was really interesting to see them be able to bring aspects of themselves to the table and i I'm now a big fan of creating improv spaces where people don't feel like they have to join any kind of group mind or hive mind, but they're like, I'm going to do improv exactly how I want to do improv. And I'm going to leave the door open for you to do improv the way you want to do improv as well. And I'm going to really keep that non-denial boosting each other up mentality. But in terms of style or content or assumptions around what would happen in a scene I'm going to just do exactly what I think would happen. And we're just going to negotiate on stage between these two ideas. And we're just going to see what comes out of it because I always find the most interesting improv comes from that. And that's then the kind of improv that people then get into really deep conversations about afterwards. Cause they go, Oh, I never thought about it that like that way. Um, how did you come to that conclusion about not being upset that when I came forward and said, I've been cheating on you as a character, your character wasn't upset. And it was like, you clearly have a different approach to relationships. Maybe you're not from within the um, heterosexual or monogamous culture. Tell me more about how that's happened. And you can use it as a platform to like learn more about each other. Yeah, man. Awesome. I love this idea of it all it not just being like my favorite art form, but also like this cool way to get, to get to know new people. Where it's like, oh, really? Interesting. That's uh, that's so great. 
Um, Joe, thank you so much for chatting with me. I have one last question for you just to finish because we've been chatting for quite a long time. I've taken a mm-hmm. ton of your day. But let me just ask you one final question, and then I'll uh, release you to your exciting evening. Um, when you are – you're clearly part of, you know, artistic communities, and you're developing things and working on projects, but – what are you doing for yourself? What are you doing to fill up your own creative cup? How do you um, make yourself better when you're not outputting? What are you inputting? Um, yeah, so I'm trying to get back into reading. I've always had a very mixed relationship with reading because I love stories, but I really struggle to maintain the concentration to keep reading. But I'm, I'm pushing myself back into it, and I'm currently reading this amazing book called More Dew, which is – a fantasy book but not like any fantasy i've ever read before and it's one of these stories it's like you couldn't get this anywhere outside of books it's so unique and really wonderful uh and i also uh genuinely play video games as a form of like artistic absorption i really like immersive artistic story driven games so i'm currently playing ori and the will of the wisps which is this beautiful little platformer that has just the most gorgeous art style and the most like it's a game that made me cry within the first two minutes because of like the story of it, this simple child storybook style story, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and then I like watching the same TV shows over and over. So I've just started my thousandth rewatch of Peep Show. Just a gr- just an amazing, amazing show. Highly recommend. One of those uh, possibly slightly lesser known British TV shows that does have enough of a following in America that I would say it does translate and i highly recommend giving it a go peep show it's just uh just just a real real good show awesome <laughs> shout out to peep show like it yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they need it they need it it's a it's a very it's an underground show no oh one's yeah no it. one's ever heard of it absolutely <laughs> Oh my God, Joe, it has been a total pleasure hanging out with you today. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, And I also appreciate how like we got so into it so early that I was like, wait, we've already done so many good podcast things. Let's just keep going. We did a a whole podcast with, and then we were like, oh, now let's do the podcast. (laughs) I feel like I've done that a lot lately. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all of our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.